Brexit. I hear you moan, probably suffering from Brexit fatigue. I sympathise. I'm not going to add to that fatigue. I'm going to try and clear away some of the myths surrounding Brexit in our world, in our legal world. Does Brexit affect the enforceability of arbitration awards? Does Brexit affect the enforceability of English judgments? Can Brexit be a force majeure event or a frustration, frustration of a contract? I'm going to explore these in the next 10 minutes. The talk is entitled Brexit, Judgment, Frustration, Tariffs and a little bit more. And I'm going to go through those in the next 10 minutes. First of all, the political landscape. We know there's going to be a vote in Parliament on the 12th of March 2019, a vote on the so-called new withdrawal agreement. If that agreement is accepted by Parliament, by a majority, we will leave with the withdrawal agreement intact on the 29th of March 2019. If, as many predict, it will either not be presented to Parliament or it will not successfully pass by majority, better view is that Parliament will be invited to agree an extension, an extension to Article 50. Actually, reading Article 50, you can see it provides for such a possibility, but it also requires a unanimous agreement, and therefore all European states will have to agree. In the better view, it will be a short extension, and provided the reasons properly articulated, it will be granted. Now, let's be clear. A new withdrawal agreement, an amended withdrawal agreement, perhaps now or indeed by virtue of an extension, is just part of the equation. That provides for withdrawal, but doesn't provide beyond. It doesn't involve a free trade agreement, and of course has with it transitional terms that maintains the status quo. So the withdrawal agreement is step one, but the big issue to emerge is step two, agreeing a trade relationship, a future trade relationship with our former European partners. Paddy Power. Yes, a great research tool when it comes to the possibilities and the odds of those possibilities. And looking at these odds, it seems that a withdrawal agreement or an extension are by far the favoured options. The prospects of a crashing out, a no withdrawal agreement, looks to be less likely. Okay, let's turn to awards and judgments and let's demystify and cut to the chase. Will Brexit, deal or no deal, have any impact on the enforceability of arbitration awards? No. The New York Convention assists a party in enforcing an arbitration award and countries like Switzerland are obviously signatories. So no effect at all on arbitration awards. What about judgments, English judgments? Well, the position there is, is, is more complex. Deal or no deal, all roads really point to Rome and The Hague. What do I mean by that? Well, Rome 1, Rome 2 deals with the choice of law, and it's been said we will sign up as part of domestic law to those principles. So the choice of law is intact. When it comes to the enforceability of English judgments, it's almost certain now that we will be signatories to the Hague Convention. The Hague Convention facilitates and assists the enforcement, in this case, of English judgments. And whilst not ideal and not as good as the current system, is a pretty good starting base. So as I say, all roads point to Rome and the Hague, and there will be therefore support and respect for the choice of law and the enforcement of English judgments. Other commentators talk about the possibility of us signing up or agreeing the Lugano Convention, less likely as things stand at the moment, or of course a negotiated recast Brussels. Uh, that's also a possibility. And as a final backstop, as is now a fashionable word, you have the common law and national law, which still means English judgments are enforceable. It just requires a different process, perhaps greater patience. But I think if I was to make a prediction, that the combination of Rome and the Hague Convention will, I think, facilitate and ease some of the concerns and pain. I'm not alone in that view. Indeed, in 2017, Lord Justice Hamlin 
presented a paper in Hong Kong looking at what he described as the myths of Brexit. In conclusion, he said, there are and remain good reasons for choosing English law, English jurisdiction and English arbitration. Brexit will not impact on the essential reasons for so doing, and you should ignore the myth makers. Hear, hear, ignore the myth makers. I said I would look at the issue of whether Brexit could be a force majeure event or indeed a legally frustrating event. Let's take these in stages. We know that you can't rely upon force majeure unless you have a provision in the contract that gives you that right. There must be a force majeure clause for there to be any chance or any prospect of being able to declare force majeure. The better view, and we've written extensively about this, is because Brexit is fiscal, economic in heart and nature, it's going to be quite difficult to declare force majeure because of the financial consequences of Brexit. Just because a contract is more onerous, more financially expensive, we, we know, doesn't justify force majeure. Economic force majeure is simply not respected, absence of very extensive clause, and it's therefore unlikely that parties will seek comfort or be able to successfully declare force majeure. That view is supported by the recent English judgment, discussed in several articles and indeed receiving some media attention, between the European Medicines Agency and Canary Wharf, just to recap the facts briefly, as the slide shows, the agency held an underlease for some time, until in fact 2039, and they wrote to Canary Wharf, the landlords, saying that essentially when Brexit occurs, we will treat this as a frustrating event. In fact, to be more particular, it was the actual withdrawal on the 29th of March that they said was indeed a frustrating event. No issue of force majeure here, because focus isn't on any force majeure clause. The sole issue is on the doctrine or the concept of legal frustration, i.e. the contract has become so, so, um, so burdensome, so radically different, that it would be unjust to hold the parties to that bargain. There's been a fundamental change in the contract's dynamics that it is only fair and just for the law to relieve the parties, both parties, from the burden of the contract. So the agency argued for various reasons that the long-term underlease would be frustrated once we actually left the EU. The argument failed, failed for several reasons. It failed because the court said that there wasn't a supervening illegality. The court was not moved by the arguments that it, limitations on the capacity of the agency would justify supervening illegality. The court was also not moved that the commercial purpose of the contract, the common purpose of the contract, was frustrated. Fatal, I think, to the agency's case was the fact that the lease did provide for subletting and the right of assignment. And whilst inconvenient, whilst far from ideal, whilst financially burdensome, to sublease and become a landlord effectively, that did seriously undermine, fatally undermine, the concept that the commercial purpose had become frustrated. Not, not so. The lease provided for, the, for that very eventuality that you might have to, in certain circumstances, sublet or assign. It's also fair to say that the court concluded that the EU should have done more when faced with the prospects of having to relocate in this case to Amsterdam, and that the court was convinced that there was actually, uh, uh, it was a scenario of self-induced frustration, where much more could have been done to, to, to assist the agency and to relieve it of some of the severe consequences. So a failure there by the agency to demonstrate that the doctrine of frustration was engaged and successfully engaged. The case is going to appeal. Uh, we, we learned that on the 1st of March, in fact, permission to appeal to the Court of Appeal uh, was granted. So we'll have to watch this space to see whether the Court of Appeal takes a different view. The chances are it'll end up in the Supreme Court. But I'd be very surprised. I'd be very surprised if there was a change. And indeed, the case is a useful 
analysis of frustration, both the history of and a, an application to a commercial lease. I want to turn now to my final topic on Brexit, which is tariffs. We all know that if we fall out, if the United Kingdom falls out of the European Union without a deal, we'll go back to WTO tariffs. We will move from a zone of tariff-free trade with our European, former European partners to one of WTO tariff terms. Just to guide you through the complexities of tariffs, two, two points to bear in mind. One is that tariffs are origin and focus. Tariffs attach to the origin of the goods as opposed to perhaps the various countries that the goods pass through. So we're concerned here with origin. We're also concerned with the impossession. Who, who has the burden? Who has to pay the tariffs? And one's broadly speaking looking at the buyer, looking at the importer. What I'd say about tariffs is it's a vital, vital now and indeed vital, or it's always been vital, to ensure that your contracts are, are tariff clear, i.e. they make proper allocation. They deal very precisely with who has to, to bear the tariff burden. Of course, buying and selling European goods at the moment, such as grain, there are no tariffs. But going forward, it's important for the contract to deal specifically with, with which, which party, buyer or seller, has the tariff burden. It's also very important looking across the Atlantic with the, the difficulties of, 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 of China and, um, and uh, the US, those trade uh, tariffs and tensions said to be likely to ease, but still very, 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 very uh, significant. And again, it's important that the contract allocates tariff burden. An example of that is, is GAFTA Clause 14, GAFTA uh, Form 27, where the burden of tariffs and uh, taxes, duties and levies is, is plainly uh, placed on the importer, the buyer. I go even further and say that tariff clauses should be even clearer and we should be getting those contracts and clauses right now for the trades and the tariff challenges of the future. Control or ensure control your contractual destiny. So as you know, or some of you know, we write a number of packs on various topics. Recently we did a bunker pack and we will be soon doing a sugar pack, a pack looking at freezers called the freezer pack and other packs going forward. Can I bring to your attention a pack that deals with repossession risk and cyber risk? It seems to me that sale contracts are still not grappling with, in contractual terms, cyber risk or indeed the risk in the case of, for example, a SIF sale, the carrier going bust or the vessel being repossessed. These are risks outside the solvency of the parties. The carrier going bust is different, of course, from the uh, buyer or the seller becoming insolvent. Can I commend you to read and to look at the repossession cyber packs? There's wording in there that deals with the sort of wording you should have in your sale contracts, in your charter parties, in your bills of lading. And it's important now to put that wording in, again, to ensure that you control your contractual destiny. Thank you for listening to 10 Minutes on Brexit and a little more. The key message is, yes, it's uncertain, Yes, we don't quite know how it's all going to end, but what's important is that we ensure that our contract, as best we can, provides for certain eventualities. Make sure your contracts are tariff fit. Make sure your contracts contain, if you want to, a force majeure provision. Make sure that your contracts deal with cyber and deal with repossession risk. And let's make sure that we control our contractual destiny. Thank you.